Okay, so let's see. Um, thank you. Um, so I thought what I could do is get a sense for who's here. So I, I, I don't talk you know, um, too low level or too high level. So how many people uh, are, have done computer science? Okay, wow. Because uh, data science people don't claim to, you know, they're usually reformed physicists like uh, <laughs> all over. Uh, uh, what about like stats people? Um, okay, yeah. Um, physics. Uh, okay, so that's, that gives me a good idea. What about social sciences? Anybody here doing social sciences? Okay, wow. Um, so feel free to ask questions. You know, I'm um, I'm going to start talking about things and then just interrupt me, ask questions, something not clear. Um, so I'm going to start with depressing you guys first because you know everybody talks about data is great and, and so I'll start from depressing stories and, and then and then we'll try to cheer people up. Um, so, so depressing story number one. Um, there is um, a problem with lead poisoning in, in the US and other countries right now. So most of you probably know, long time ago, um, in the seven, until the 70s, paint that was used had lead in there. Many other things had lead additives in there. The, the problem with lead is um, when you paint walls with lead, it's usually fine. With, with paint that has lead, it's usually fine for a while. But then after 10, 20, 30 years, paint starts falling off the walls. And lead particles are exposed in the air. They fall on the ground, um, which is fine for us adults. It doesn't do anything for us. But for kids, when they're crawling around, they, they pick up that, and they put it in their mouth. Lead goes into their, their bloodstream. And the body uses, basically thinks of lead as calcium. So the bone absorbs lead. And the damages that happen because of that are irreversible. So the damages that happen with lead uh, are pretty horrible. Um, you've got you know, lower IQ, hearing loss, impaired attention, memory loss, motor control issues. And that happens because once lead goes into your, your, your bones, later on, instead of calcium coming out, lead starts coming out. So it's, it's, it cannot be fixed. There's no way to, to reverse the damage once it's done. Um, so every home built typically before 1977 has lead paint in there, unless it's been rehabbed or not. Um, today, the, the way this problem is dealt with uh, is surprisingly wonderful. Um, so what people do today, public health departments, is um, most kids have to get tested, their blood test at some, some age, typically before going to school. And if they find high levels of lead in their blood, um, the public health department gets a report. They go into their homes and check for lead. And if it turns out there's lead, they ask people to fix it. They ask the homeowner to fix it. That's wonderful for the kid who's going to live there next. Horrible for the kid who just got diagnosed because nothing can be done. Um, so the policy that's used today is to use kids as sensors uh, to detect lead because that's the most efficient way of detecting lead. It's 100% accurate. Uh, whenever there's a kid poisoned with lead, there is most likely lead paint in the home. So you don't waste any resources um, looking for lead when they may not exist. Um, but you know it's a horrible policy. Um, but that's the best they've been doing so far. Right? So I'll come back to that. But, but so depressing story number one. Um, uh, depressing story number two. Um, so there's a large number of, of teen, first time pregnant women um, in, you know, all over the world. So typically, th this is a problem. You know, people who are, sort of the, 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 there is, there's a nonprofit, Nurse Family Partnership. And they've been around for about 20 something years working with kids, uh, working with um, kids, uh, teenage, uh, first time young mothers who are going to have, who are going to give birth, but they don't quite know how to deal with, with um, being pregnant. They, they don't have a support structure. It's the first time they're pregnant. Um, often what happens with them is they, they end up um, quitting their jobs if they had one. They end up uh, dropping out of high school. Um, they end up potentially having you know, preterm birth. They don't know enough about immunization or other things that you have to um, deal with with the kid. So, so pretty horrible outcomes for a lot of first time uh, teen, young, single mothers. So there's family partnership works uh, w across the country with, with these uh, mothers. And what they do is they pair up a nurse with a mother so that they can work through them to help them with their economic um, outcomes as well as the health outcomes for the, for both for the kid and for the mom. And what they start working is if, uh, during pregnancy time, and they continue working up to age two for the kid. The problem they, they're struggling with, as they're growing, they have a really hard time um, 
trying to scale with as more nurses come on board, trying to figure out uh, there are too many risks these mothers are uh, are facing. How do I figure out which which risk to focus on with each mother? How do I personalize some of the care, and how do I scale um, as I grow? And so that's a big, and it's not just a, a nurse family partnership issue. There's a huge component of that in ACA Obamacare, and they don't quite have a good handle on how to deal with with these problems. Uh, third third um, story. I'm going to skip that for now. Um, so this stat sounds like it came from you know a, a, a developing country. 30% uh, of kids drop out of high school. Um, that is the US. It's pretty similar to India. India has about 35% dropout rate. Um, and, and it's a pretty large number. And that's just a dropout rate. It's not, you know, it, there are other things that happen. Um, kids take, you know, seven years to graduate. And that's often as bad in terms of outcomes uh, as, as dropping out of, uh, of high school. Um, then there is the undermatching problem of kids who are graduating but, um, and they're qualified, they can go to a good school, but they don't apply to college. Uh, or they apply to a college that is uh, a much lower uh, potential college than, than the, st the student has aptitude for. And so for example, you know, if they often they'll end up going to a community college with a 10, 15% graduation rate, um, and where they could have gone to a top tier college. And there are hundreds of thousands of those kids around the country who either drop out or finish late or undermatched, don't apply to college. Um, and right now, there's not much schools are doing to target their efforts. They have lots of programs that try to keep them in school, but the programs are too generic, uh, and they don't really have the resources or the tools to target their attention at, um, at the kids who need that, that intervention. Right? So the reason I'm kind of giving some of these examples is that there's a common theme here, which is we're kind of dealing with social problems that are very prevalent that we're all facing, um, but very few people are working on them. Uh, and, and very few people um, are really looking at how do we solve them in collaboration with the organizations that have these problems. Right? Because we sort of, you know, so I'm at the University of Chicago, and I can't solve these problems by myself. I don't know the problem. I don't understand what the real problems are. I don't have the data. Um, and even if I had all the data and understood the problems, I couldn't go off and, go, you know, and, and fix the, the lead poisoning problem uh, or the school dropout problem. Um, so what I kind of want to spend some time doing over the next sort of half an hour, 40 minutes, is give you some examples of these problems so you get a sense for what kinds of issues are out there that we think we can use data to help solve. And then how do we create these collaborations with the organizations who have the problem so we can help them solve the problem, we can make it easier for them to solve these problems. And then how do we get students and other people involved in, in working towards um, that model? Um, so let me give you a few examples of how you can you know, at least attempt to solve some of these problems. So the lead poisoning problem, um, if you take it from a, from a computer science, machine learning, data science problem, it's, it's a fairly straightforward problem to think about, at least to formulate. Um, solving it is hard. Uh -huh. But, but the, the formulation is right now, you know, we've got all these different kids, um, and they get tested after they get lead poisoning. And they've got all these different homes that get inspected after the kid is poisoned. So you can imagine, you know, if you've, if you've done any machine learning, well, we can predict which kids are going to get poisoning, and we can predict which homes are likely to have lead hazards, and we can go and, and, and test those kids earlier, and we could do preventative inspections. And that part is kind of obvious, but the, the challenge is the, the public health organizations don't have that understanding. They don't quite think about things in preventative ways. They sort of often think about, we've got this many resources to test these homes, and if I test you know, a, a thousand homes, I'm being, um, I'm being sort of, my performance is based on how many, how many homes with lead do I find. And the more I find, the more uh, my, my metrics go up, right? So if I'm doing preventative work, then I'm wasting some effort. I'm wasting time checking for homes that are not, uh, that don't have lead hazards. And, and so in Chicago, what happened was they, this, the, the lead, the public health department came to us about a year ago um, and said, well, here's a problem we're facing. We know we can do better. We know we can do some preventative work, um, but we have no idea what to do. Um, so what we did was we worked with them. So we got, the, the, the good thing is in a lot of these problems, there's a lot of data that exists inside these organizations, mostly for compliance purposes, right? So they, they 
gave us access to data that was 20 years of uh, lead inspections in all the homes that they've tested in Chicago. So for every home that was inspected, um, we had the, you know, the address of the home, the inspection results, whether there was a hazard, whether it was not a hazard, whether it was fixed, not fixed. And then they had 20 years of uh, blood test data for every kid in Chicago over the past you know, 20 years, where you know what the kid is, you know when they were tested, uh, and what the result, what the blood lead level was. Uh, it's called the BLL level for these kids. And so given those two things, um, you, know, you can imagine you could take all the data and now build a model that can predict um, which kid is likely to get lead poisoning. Um, and it turns out when we do that, you get pretty good, sorry, pretty good results. So, so we're looking at, you know, the, the graph on the left um, is the, so the, the, the CDC has BLL levels, so five is the sort of a, a threshold, where above five it's bad, below five it's not great, but it's, it's okay. Um, so if you look at, you know, uh, it turns out that you can pretty accurately, you know, uh, the distribution of scores for, for the BLL, but then you know, if you look at sort of an ROC curve, it turns out that you can do better than a lot of, you know, uh, this is the random line, but what they're doing today is even a random thing might not be a horrible thing to do because it's, it's being done in a preventative way, right? So today, the policy is do it afterwards. So you're not doing any prevention at all. So even randomly doing <laughs> something is not a bad idea, but we think we can do a lot better. Um, so the, what we found is that there are sort of a few things we found that were interesting. One thing we found that when kids are born, they have pretty low blood lead levels. So you know, they're typically not born with, with lead. As they go older, so between one and two, they start diverging. And after two, so one and two is when they start crawling, they start putting lead in their mouth. After two, the lead levels are completely diverged and nothing, and it doesn't change. And what we found is looking at this, we can actually predict um, at month three, month six, like before age one, which kids are going to have that trajectory and which kids are going to have these trajectory. So the policy change you want to make is right now the policy is test them before they go to school at age five, is just predict that and shift that at month six, month seven, month eight. That requires no extra resources um, and actually prevents these things from happening. Um, so based on these results, so that was, you know, th that was sort of the easy part. The hardest part in this was making sure, getting this data from them, right? Kind of creating this collaboration. And then in a work, over two or three months, we were able to do some pretty quick work that showed them that. But the next thing was, okay, how do I, how do I take this result and, and have an impact with that? Because this result by itself is, is, you know, it's good to talk about, but it's still nothing has changed. Um, and the nice thing was that the, the, what they were able to do, uh, uh, two different, three different things actually. One thing is um, what they're doing now is using these models to figure out which homes to inspect. Um, uh, and so they have you know, certain resources, they can inspect 100 homes a week which homes should they inspect? And we can now uh, target homes. Now the tricky thing here is that one is predicting which homes are gonna have lead. The second is predicting which homes are likely to have kids or pregnant women. Because just because a home has lead doesn't mean that there's somebody in there at risk of getting lead poisoning. If there's no kid in there, eh, you can skip that home for now because that's, that's a lower priority home. Uh, ideally every home would be fixed, but now if there's no kid today, it doesn't mean there's gonna be no kid tomorrow or next week or next, so you kind of have to take historical data on kids and pregnancies and kind of predict which homes are likely to have kids moving in there or people getting pregnant. But once you've done that, um, now you have a prioritized list for them to inspect the homes and, and, and do preventative work. The second way this is being used is it's being implemented into the electronic medical record system in hospitals. So when a pregnant mother comes in um, and gets a checkup, um, a flag goes up if, this, uh, if the kid that's gonna be born is likely to get lead poisoning so that the public health department has enough time to go in, do a check, and then do the remediation before the kid is born. Um, so that's the second thing to implemented. The third thing that, that they're working on is doing more targeted outreach. So they have, they've got some budget to do inspections in places that are not necessarily uh, high risk, but the people have to ask for it. You can't just go to show up to a home and say, I'd like to do an inspection. So they've got some budget to do some free inspections. They can't just show up. And so using these models to go in and, and target people and say, hey, you, you, you might be at risk uh, and we can do a free inspection if you want. Here's how horrible the results are if you don't do this. And so they're using these models to go and, and do preventative you know, outreach so that they could do these, these inspections. Right. Um, so that's one example. I'll talk about a few more, few more things. Um, 
the other example we're talking about, the, the first time you know, um, pregnant uh, teen mothers. So when, when the nurse family partnership team works with them, um, here's, let's see, where is, oh, I'm skipping. Um, so, so there are a few different things that they're, they're looking at. They're looking at making sure, one, the person stays with the program. Um, because if they drop out, they can't do anything to help them. Um, and depending on the risk of dropping out, they want to treat them differently. The second thing they're looking at is you know, a bunch of different other risk factors. So if we look at, so this is their, the dropout rate, right? So um, the, the, everybody starts off enrolled and people start dropping off. Dropping out for neutral reasons, good reasons, bad reasons. And then about 40% of the people stay enrolled in the program. So they have a 60% dropout rate. Um, and typically, you know, about 25% uh, of the people, 30% of the people who leave are for bad reasons, or for undesirable reasons. And so the idea is, can I predict in the beginning which moms are at risk of dropping out for bad reasons so I can pay extra attention to them up front um, instead of trying to get them, you know, to, to make sure that they have a job or they stay in school. It really focuses to keep them in the program. Or if I know they're going to drop out, I can't talk to them anymore. I can't contact them. So can I start getting extra information from them and getting no names or phone numbers of relatives or parents or neighbors so that if I start losing them, um, something new. That's only happened in Windows, right? <laughs> okay. Um, so I can start doing that. So what we did working with them was, this was an interesting story. So. For when we're working with their family partnership, most nonprofits, the way they use data typically is to justify funding. Uh, and, and that's sort of coming from, you know, if you talk to a typical nonprofit person, they'll, this is actually somebody from there saying, you know, so far we've only used data to justify our funding. Somebody gives you money, you generate a report with a bunch of numbers saying, here's what we did with your money. And when, so when they first started working with us, what they were interested in was um, giving a report to the Congress to allocate funding to these types of programs through the Obamacare program. And they said, hey, can you help us evaluate our impact so we can go in and, and write this report? We said, sure, we can do that. And we sort of helped them with that. Once we'd done that, we said, well, how about we help you improve what you're actually doing instead of just justifying the money? And they were a little bit skeptical. So after we'd done work with them, what, was there really, what we produced for them was basically this type of system where when a nurse is looking and a, and a person comes in, uh, a client, and a, uh, a nurse gets basically a risk profile for the mother. And it tells them the different risk levels for each outcome that they care about. Because their job is to improve all of, you know, it's, it's just a small list of, small list of these outcomes. Um, but they, their job is to focus on all of them. And what they told us is it's very overwhelming to look at all of these different risk factors. I can't treat all of them. So if you can help me figure out which ones this mother is at risk of the most, I can start really focusing on that one. So for, for you know, this mom, I really want to focus on dropout, but then also on school outcomes. She's going to be fine with her job. She's going to continue doing that. Whereas over here, the main thing, and you can argue whether breastfeeding is good or bad. Uh, for now, CDC says it's good, so, so they follow that. Um, but the other things you don't have to worry about. Um, and so when we were working with them on this, what they said was there are two really nice things about this. One is... It really helps their nurses, especially the new nurses, to really focus their attention. Um, the second thing it helps is they have, and most nonprofits have this problem of uh, the people in the field hate collecting data because they don't get the point. Like, well, I have to help these moms. If I'm collecting data for you, I'm wasting my time writing down things when I should be helping the moms. That's my job. Especially when they see the data is being used to justify the funding thing, write this report and nothing happens. When we start producing this, well, they came back and said, oh, this is great because now we can tell them why they're collecting this data. It's helping them do their jobs better and improve the health of the mothers they're responsible for. And that gives them an extra incentive to collect the right data to make sure everything's there because they're seeing a very direct benefit of, of that data that they collect. Uh, so it's a really nice side effect. And I didn't really think, I mean, I would never have been able to come up with that. It was when I mean, we were talking to the, the nurse family partnership team. Um, this was coming from them. This was a really interesting thing to look at. Um, so this is you know, an example of, you know, again, um, when we're looking at predicting the dropout time, we can sort of predict pretty, pretty early you know, how, how accurately we can. And so the later, of course, we can predict really well in the beginning of the program, 
who's going to drop out, and we can predict really well towards the end of the program. The middle is the part that the predictions are not very good at. Um, and we're still working on this project right now to kind of figure out how do we, because we're already early indicators of what's, what's a, what kind of people drop out, and they're really good indicators towards the end. It's sort of right after birth, a few months after birth, that things shift a little, and you don't get data often enough. The frequency starts going down with that data because mothers start dropping uh, visits, and they don't really show up. And, and so we're still kind of working, trying to figure out how do we, how do we improve uh, the middle part, because that's often where a lot of the flux is, is happening. So the, 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 the last depressing story is talking about of, of the 30% of the dropout rate. Um, the way initially that project started um, for us was we were initially working, um, when, when we started the social data science for social good program, I got a random email from um, the guy who runs the, sort of the research uh, group in the, the evaluation group in Mesa Public School District in Arizona. Um, and his email was basically, you know, we heard you're doing this program. We'd love to see if we can get any help. We've got really smart kids in our school district who um, we think are really good, but they, sorry. <laughs> there you go, Microsoft, of course. Uh, slides are optional, and I'm not really using the, it's just to keep you awake. So when you wake up, you know what slide I'm on uh, there. Um, so we have really good students, but uh, they, a lot of them end up going to the local community college that has a 12.5% graduation rate. Um, and they said, well, we think data can really help. We've heard about you know, people using data to do. Um, so, so we've been collecting data, and we bought a copy of this software called SPSS. Um, but we don't really know what to do with it. <laughs> can you guys help? I'm like, sure. So we started working with them, and we helped them kind of uh, identify which students are at risk of undermatching. Um, that led to some work with uh, um, a couple other school districts, including, so the one I'm going to talk about a little bit more is Montgomery County School District, which is one of the larger school districts. Uh, it's in Maryland. And they had, the, they had a dropout problem. We said a lot of these kids are dropping out. Can we figure out how to, how to um, uh, identify them? Because we have a ton of programs we run that are intervention programs. But right now, the intervention programs are just untargeted. We try to cover as many kids as possible because we don't miss anybody. Um, but that means that it's, it's self-selected. People show up, and mostly the kids who are not going to drop out show up to these programs. So that's, that's really not the right, right thing. And so what, they, what we did with them was we looked at their existing system. And they were very data-driven, which meant that they had a team of people who would look at data, uh, a lot of data, look at all the kids who are uh, not graduating, and then come up with a set of rules. Um, so it's a traditional, you know, rule-based model, right? So they came up with a rule-based model, and they would have a, you know, they would have a criteria. So today, the most advanced school districts, the way they do dropout prediction, is they have a binary criteria. Either you fit the criteria or you don't. So these are the kids who are going to drop out, and these are kids who are not going to drop out. Um, and the problem with that, one, that it's, you know, we all know the problem with rule-based systems, right? They're brittle. They're hard to build. They're hard to maintain. They don't give you a ranking. So you have a binary buck, uh, set of yes and no. Either you do something with all of them or you don't. Um, so what we did was, again, we, we got data from them about um, for their kids. And the typical data was you know, the demographics of the kids, their test scores, their grades, their attendance. Typically, dropout is, is a function of uh, attendance, grades, um, and um, Attendance grades and sort of and demographics, right? So those are the those are the three three predictors. And what we did was, you know, the idea was to can we predict pretty early on, as early as possible, um, how uh, how likely somebody is to drop out uh, or not to finish high school in time? And the, again, the idea was it's pretty large school district, so you're you care less about how correct you are. You care about I can only take action on X percent of the kids. I'm not going to be able to go on all of them. So I can only take action on the top 10 percent of the kids. How many of those kids are going to drop out? What's my precision in the top 10 percent of my predictions? And so when you look at that graph, so the, the, the blue one is the one. So I'm predicting in sixth grade if you're going to drop out of high school. The rule-based one they had built um, was ballpark you know, 40 percent accurate uh, precision. So if, if they had 10,000 kids, they're acting on the top 1,000, um, only 400 of them were going to drop out. So that was their existing efficiency. Um, and what we were able to do was pretty off-the-shelf um, algorithms, you know, uh, 
loaded in random forest, taking all that data, being able to predict, you know, we could easily just double that accuracy. Um, and, and that was, you know, for them, that was surprising because they thought they were doing a really good job. And when they started working with us, they were a little bit skeptical. They kind of told us towards the end, it's like, well, our boss told us to work with you guys, uh, but we didn't think we were going to really do any better because we've been doing this for a long time. And what we sort of tried to convince them was that, you know, it's not like we know something you don't. It, it, it's, it's not magic. You guys have done a lot of the hard work with collecting data and putting it all together, and you have a lot of intuitions. We just sort of use those intuitions as input and let the computer find these things, right? So we took a lot of the same features in their model, and we just sort of tried a different approach. Um, uh, the other thing we tried to do was uh, not just predicting if they're going to drop out, but the urgency of the action, when they're going to drop out. Because somebody's going to drop out in three years, there's only so much you can do right now. And you might not want to prioritize doing something with them as opposed to the kids who are going to drop out in the next month, in the next three months, six months. So, so there was the one aspect of just a binary prediction. The second aspect was to predict the urgency of that action, of the, when, that, when that action was going to happen. Um, so based on sort of this work, one of the things we're doing now is we sort of have working with about eight or nine different school districts around the country to try to see if there is something we can generalize. Is there a generalizable model that can be used to predict outcomes, sort of risk outcome behaviors in uh, kids who are going to school? So dropping out, not finishing, not going to college, um, other risky behaviors, and can we sort of do something that is across the board, um, and that can be also useful for smaller school districts who don't have a lot of kids. If you've only got 50 kids in your high school class, you're never going to have enough data to build these models for yourself. Is there anything we can do that transfers uh, from other large school districts? Is there something inherent about the kids that we can transfer over that helps us with predictions? Don't know. Uh, it's too early for us to say that. But the idea is both can we do something general on the model side? Second is can we do something general in the, in the modeling pipeline? Can we build these things so we're all this that we're building, we're trying to build it in a way that we can tell the schools, if you put your data in this form, um, the system will kind of take it from there and start sort of building these models and show you results that you can use to start improving things. So because they're not going to have resources internally to, to, to ever do this, especially if it's a small school district. So how do we take you know, the, the approaches we're taking and making it more scalable for them to do it themselves? Um, and then you know, some more results on if you, you know, looking at early predictions, it turns out that you know, we're, we're not sort of, they, you know, there are, they look pretty reasonable in terms of what, what you would expect. And I can point you to some, some papers that we have on, on, this, uh, on these results. So abstracting a little bit, right? So as we work with these organizations, with government agencies, with nonprofit partners, we're basically realizing that there are three reasons why uh, this kind of, that they haven't been doing this work before, right? One reason is um, they just don't have access to people who, who can do this work. Like a lot of us, um, you know, if you take people in universities, you know, we, we do often don't have the right incentives in a university to do applied work that has an impact. You know, we're, we're, we're incented to teach and to get tenure. <laughs> And, and none of those involve, you know, actual, at least in computer science, having any impact on society. Right? And it's unfortunate. It's, it's, so, and then in industry, it's, it's hard to kind of, you know, maybe the, 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 you don't really have the right incentives either. Uh, and you can either go work at, you know, Google or Facebook, or you can do something useful. Um, and often it's, it's the former uh, people end up doing. We're not in South Bay, so we can say that, right? Uh, <laughs> um, so, so one is people, lack of not lack of people who care, lack of people who are actually doing the work. Because um, everybody inherently, I think, cares. It's just turning that care into something tangible is often really hard for various reasons. And we don't make it easy to, to make that connection. The second problem is, even if we had the people, even if all of us said, you know, we want to do this uh, and we want to help you, you go to a nonprofit and you say, I want to help you do better. Uh, and I can help you with data. And, and often they'll say, yeah, you ha I have some homes you can paint, and there's some you know, yard work you can do, and you can go read things to kids. Not that none of those things are valuable, but we can have a much bigger impact with some of these, with, with the kind of work um, we can do. But often, they, they don't quite know how to take advantage of them. And one of the reasons is that they don't really have, they don't have peers, they don't have use cases, they don't have stories they've heard from their peers about this work. So when they hear of examples, they hear of examples from Netflix and Amazon and Microsoft and Google and Facebook and, 
and they think, well, that's not, that's not us. That's not for us. That's for them. Um, then they might hear from examples, you know, from when I was in my Obama campaign days, they hear from examples from that, but they still say, well, you guys had a billion dollars. You can do that. We, we can't do that. So there's a lack of you know, examples that they can relate to that makes them excited about this. And then the third problem, which is kind of connected to uh, part of the first problem, is that there are no tools out there today that are customized for their needs. Right? So if you're a large phone company, if you're AT&T, T-Mobile, um, you want to build system to predict who's going to leave you as a customer, there is a billion tools out there that you can do churn prediction. It's already prepackaged. You put in your data. It builds, it builds models. It may not be great, but it's good enough. Um, but if you're you know, a retailer and want to do demand prediction or pricing, there's a tool out there. If you're a nonprofit or a government, you, know, you have SPSS, right? Like that's what you start with. Uh, or you start with you know, raw Python and R. And so that you start from such a basic level that you don't have the resources internally to, to, to start solving problems because everything is too generic. There's nothing customized for you. Um, and so even if you have the people uh, and good intentions, you don't have a starting point. It's just too, uh, too, too hard to really get there. Um, so what we've really, you know, the way we've been structuring the work we're doing, at least in the university in Chicago, is trying to see can we get rid of some of those barriers? Can we start uh, making it easy for people to one, can we get people to, to you know, train them to work on these problems? And a large part of it is not that people don't know how to work on problems because they, the large part is that there is no, they're not exposed to these problems. Right? For, you know, even you know, until I was doing this work, I couldn't really tell you what are the big public health challenges in, in the world today. What are the big challenges in educa education or in economic development? Um, I could tell you, you know, how to make Google search better. I could tell you how LinkedIn could do better and Twitter could do better because I have experience as a consumer. We have ideas on how to do things that we use, but most of us don't consume social services. Most of us don't consume things, um, are not at risk of these things, and we have, don't have really understanding of these problems. Um, and so the first part was really how do we make people more aware of these problems and get a link between the skills that we have are actually useful in solving them. It's not about you know, unskilled work, or the work we're doing can actually have an impact on these problems. And so I'll talk a little bit more about the, the program that we run um, in, in a couple of minutes. The second thing we started doing is looking at how do we create collaborative projects that give not just the people we work with examples, but then their peers. How do we give their peers examples of here's a real project that was done with this real partner who's a peer of yours, and um, and, and how can we use that as a, as a case study to get them really excited about working on these things? Because that's, that's often the hardest thing to do is you can get, you know, there are a lot of people who are interested in helping solve the problem, but getting access to the problems, the resources that will help us understand the problem and actually do something with that, that takes a lot of effort. Um, and the third part is that is, as we work on these projects, can we create reusable open source software that's that people can use um, beyond us. So even in a volunteer capacity, if a volunteer wants to work with an organization, instead of starting from scratch, they have something to start from where they can customize it, add to it. And so that's the kind of work we've been, we've been trying to do over the last couple of years. And one um, example of a project we started um, is called the Data Science for Social Good Summer Program. Um, and the summer program is really, it was more initially designed for basically <laughs> You know, people like me from computer science background who, you know, cared at some point about computer science primarily, and then and then data second, and then impact was something in the back of my mind, but not something I was going out of my way to do, right? So, so how can we take people with good intentions who are interested um, and making it easy for them to do this problem, uh, to do this work? Um, and so, this was a program we started in University of Chicago two years ago, and the goal of this program was really there were three goals, right? One was, so the way we picked, you know, the, 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 the idea was to take um, mostly students, so grad students coming from different areas, to actually first understand how to solve problems, but then to, then to understand sort of how do, we, how do we expose them to social problems so they can hopefully continue to work on this. Um, the second goal was to work with governments and nonprofits and kind of help train them a little bit, expose them um, to how do I use data to solve a problem that they have. And then the third, which is 
probably a more important goal, which we're still hoping that you know it's a long-term goal, is to really build a community of people and organizations who are working together to do this. It's not about University of Chicago. It's not about the you know the handful of people we have doing this program there, but it's how do we seed a larger group of people and how do we help them um, do this? Because individually we can't really get this done, right? Um, and the the so some numbers from the past couple of years, right? So we've had uh, I'll tell you a little bit of structure of the program, but we had 36 people our first year. We had 48 the second year, um, and it runs in the summer, 12 weeks. And we get students from a you know, bunch of different universities, uh, typically all the computer science and, and, and stats and public policy. One of the main things that's interesting here that's, that was different for me personally was trying to bring in the, the, the set of people on the, the top right, right. So typically, if you look at the computer science community, um, which is sort of where I'm from, machine learning side, we care a lot about prediction. We predict, 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 predict. Once we've predicted, we watch it happen. Uh, so, so it's really great. We admire our predictions being correct, but we can't change anything, right? We, we're, we're, we stop at the prediction level and we watch that happen. Then there's the social science community, which if I have to, you know, caricature, it's I care about behavior change, but I don't, I, wanna, I just want to do group A, group B, test my ideas and see which one works better and apply the idea to everyone, right? So that's, that's sort of the opposite of the computer science side where I'm not predicting anything. I have really good ideas and I have theories, but I could put the two together and actually be much more um, effective. And what we've tried to do is bring these people together because we think if you really want to solve a problem um, that's, that's a real social problem, you need to have all those different people working together. You need to have computer scientists, stats, um, social scientists, and public policy people because things have to get implemented as policy. It can't just be uh, uh, you know, people working and, and, and building software. And, and so what we've tried to do is kind of build, build both an understanding of, uh, everybody has an understanding of what each, each group does so that we can really create people who understand all the different aspects. They're not going to be experts in all of them, but they at least are exposed to what other people do. They've worked together on a problem with them. Um, and what we do then is, so what we end up doing is we bring students in from different universities, we put them in teams together, and each team has a project that's in partnership with a government agency or a nonprofit. And these projects sort of span education, public health, energy, sustainability, economic development, community development. We get projects that are a couple of them in Chicago, some of them are national, some of them are international. We do projects with you know, governments, nonprofits. So the idea is to have enough of a portfolio that everybody coming in is really excited about some issue that they really care about and wants to work on that. So that's kind of the, because the goal is training, we want to make sure people are really excited. So we get projects from everywhere. Um, so here, some, some projects I talked about already were you know, the, the project with public health department, the project with school districts. Um, so I'll give you a different, ex no, some of the projects. So there was a project we did with Enroll America, which is the, uh, a nonprofit uh, that is enrolling people into uh, the Affordable Care Act. And the way they were doing that initially, so they, they they initially you know, did things smartly, then sort of going out calling everybody and saying, hey, enroll in Obamacare. Um, they built a model that predicted which people are not enrolled in, Obama, uh, in insurance so that they could have now a, a list of people and their probability of not being enrolled so they can start calling those people. Now, it turns out that that's a good start, but just because somebody is not enrolled in insurance doesn't mean they can be persuaded to be enrolled in, in, in the insurance plan. So you could call the, the, the people who are most likely not to, that's the prediction part, right? I can predict they're not involved and they're not enrolled. But if I can't change their behavior, calling them is a waste of effort right now at least. Um, or if the tactic I have is calling them and telling them how good it is to enroll and how it's cheap, it could be cheaper, they might not be receptive to it. So what we worked with them was to help them predict which people are persuadable. Um, and the, the approach we took was very similar to what we did in, in the 2012 election campaign, which we could predict, you know, the idea was there, I can predict if you're going to vote for Obama or not, but then I need to predict if you're persuadable, so I can try to persuade you. And the way we did that, you do an experiment. You actually um, go in and, and persuade, you do a pre-test, and then you persuade them, and you do a post, and you build a model that basically predicts what kind of people are likely to increase their probability of uh, being uninsured and people are likely to decrease their probability of being uninsured. 
and the ones you predict are most likely to increase their probability, those are the most persuadable ones. So you can basically predict how likely is somebody to be persuaded given a contact, given a particular tactic. The second thing we help them do is, well, let's say you can predict they are, they are not insured. You can predict they're persuadable. But if you're just making phone calls, um, what if they're just not reachable by phone? You're wasting your efforts again, calling them because they're not going to pick up the phone. They're not at home in daytime. So the, third, the second thing we worked with them was to predict basically the contactability, how contactable they are with different channels. And right now, they only had two channels, phone and in person. Um, but you can imagine doing it for you know, email, TV, uh, Facebook, Twitter. So we, but looking at, again, the data they had about con phone, phone calls and if they're picked up and if they responded, you can build a model that predicts um, who is likely to pick up the phone in daytime, because that's the only time you're, suppo you're supposed to be able to call people on their landlines, which nobody really has anymore. Um, so the idea was to go from initial models to adding these pieces so you can now design a program that says, I've got I know, uh, 100 people making 5,000 calls today. Who should I call that ba the most sort of optimizes my use of the resources I have to increase the number of people that are going to be enrolled into Obamacare? Um, another project um, was with the government of uh, Mexico, and the project there was uh, dealing with maternal mortality. And one of the things Mexican so the UN has these Millennium Development Goals, and they've, one of them is about maternal mortality rates. And Mexico is one of the countries that has, um, hasn't reached uh, the, the targets they were given. So they came to us and said, well, we, we've been trying to reduce this rate, but it's not, it's not going down. We've tried. We don't really know why. We have really no idea why. So and this was one of the more exploratory projects that we took. So we want to have a portfolio, and we don't want to have too many <laughs> vague, open-ended, because it's, it may not be a really good uh, thing for a summer scope 12 week project but we sort of this is one of the ones we took and we got data from you know we had their birth data and mortality data and hospital data and clinical record data and we looked at the figure out um, what are potential um, indicators of high maternal mortality um, and, and in different areas and we turned out that, that, that there were a few different things one was the kinds of hospitals that we're going to and the kind of uh, insurance they had uh, the conjunction of the location, the hospital, and the, uh, the insurance plan was, was, a, was a very big predictor. Um, and one of the things they were able to do with that is they were able to come up with a set of, again, with, with observational data, you know, we couldn't come up with any causal uh, theories around that. But we could come up with hypotheses around what could be an indicator and then use that. So one of the things they're doing now is, is that's where I'm going after this, is uh, they're doing a, a, a pilot with UNICEF and they're giving away cell phones to these uh, women and running an SMS program uh, that's alerting them to go to the hospital for certain things at the time they're supposed to go. Um, and that was sort of a function of looking at the data and saying these are the moms who need to be enrolled in this program. And then this is what we think we want to tell them. We're running an experiment uh, with a few different treatments to see what, uh, if those hypotheses were actually correct. Uh, because we couldn't really do that with, with just observational data. So I'll have more results, you know, once the pilot, that pilot starts in the summer and it goes on for about um, six months. So I'll actually, let me actually show you guys a, few, um, a quick um, video that describes some of the other projects and also have other people describe the projects so you can get bored listening to me. Uh, let me see. Is there a For me, the most exciting thing to see over these last 12 weeks has been the gradual realization that all the fellows have had that they actually can have an impact on the world. We've been working with the Office of President of Mexico to figure out new strategies and key actionable policies that it can implement to reduce maternal deaths in Mexico. It actually literally has effects on people's lives and will help save lives. We work with the city of Mem Oops, sorry. Memphis who identify distressed properties and evaluate the effects of economic development in those communities. We were able to talk to a lot of people in city government and in the community to see what was important to them. We work with Chicago Public Schools to develop models to 
predict student enrollment to allocate budgets for the upcoming school year. We worked with the team network, part of Conservation International, and we helped them make better sense of sensor network data they've been collected in protected areas around the world. We worked with Nurse Family Partnership to help them identify clients that drop out early so that they can help more mothers and children. The sophistication of the modeling will allow us to develop tools that nurses can use in the field. It's been extremely valuable. I can't put a price on what this is worth to us. We worked with the Chicago Department of Public Health using predictive analytics tools to identify and remove lead hazards in Chicago homes before children are ever exposed. We worked with Montgomery County Public Schools and developed a system to identify students who are at risk as early and as accurately as possible. We were working with the World Bank Group developing methods for detecting collusion and fraud in contract bids that can help guide future investigations. We worked with the Chicago Alliance to End Homelessness to help those in need find stable housing. We were working with Pecan Street and the Village Oak Park here in Illinois to develop tools for homeowners to create insights on their energy use. We work with Health Leads providing actionable insights to help more low-income patients get the social services they need to live a healthier life. We worked with the Harris School of Public Policy to develop tools for automatically identifying earmarks in congressional bills and to make public a historical database of earmarks. We worked with Skills for Chicago and Future using data from CareerBuilder to help reduce unemployment in Chicago. We worked with Enroll America and Get Covered Illinois to develop new techniques to find uninsured Americans and to sign them up under the Affordable Care Act. I'm from Nigeria and West Africa and a lot of the things that I was interested in pursuing was using data science skills to tackle different policy problems that you're having in Nigeria. Something I'm passionate about is access to information and after this fellowship I'll be working at the Wikimedia Foundation. This fellowship helped me better understand the needs of nonprofits and ways that they can leverage their data to improve their social service programs. This is just the beginning for us and for the data science world. Over the last... So, so the idea, you know, when I kind of talk a little bit, sorry, <laughs> um, about the structure of the program, partially to kind of give people ideas of how it might be, you know, how we're doing it, but also to get feedback on, you know, how do we, as we're learning how to do this, um, how can we do it better? What are the other things people have done that, that would be uh, useful to, to learn from, right? So. What we try to do is, is we, we try to have fellows leave with these skills, not be experts in them, but at least be exposed to them, um, ranging from the, the computer science and programming skills to stats, machine learning, uh, to dealing with data, but then also knowing things about e you know, econometrics and social science and how to run experiments. Again, you know, if, you're looking at, if you're looking at sort of the, the, the computer science world, experimental design basically means running a simulation on your computer overnight. Uh, with offline data. And very few people in computer science would actually run real experiments. Um, and again, I can criticize that because I am part of that community. And in, in a grad school, I would never have run any experiment. It's just experiment would have been something on a computer overnight, right? Um, and then looking at how do we do, again, databases. So uh, w how do you deal with data? How do you deal with, and then the, 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 the most sort of almost critical parts of it is these two pieces, right? Problem formulation, because problems never get handed to you in a way that you can now say, this is an optimization problem, this is a regression problem. So we spend a lot of time teaching people how to take a problem that a, a, you know, a nonprofit or a government agency has and turn it into something you can actually solve. Um, and that takes a while, and then talking to people about what the solution is, how do you use it, what are the limitations, what are the caveats, um, and, and how to really do this well. So our overall summer is kind of spent working on projects um, and teaching them these skills, some of these skills through the projects, but a lot of them through workshops and tutorials and, and, and things that we do, and getting people to leave with at least an idea of how to do um, some of this work. Uh, the other thing that we're focused on looking at is kind of on the research side, we're finding that there is a lot of this intersection that hasn't been looked at. Um, these two communities have kind of mostly until the past couple of years, they've, they've been doing very similar things in some areas, but very separately. And there, there are things you can do to bring together. There are a lot of machine learning research ideas that come out when looking at social science problems and vice versa. And so there's a lot of new work that's happening, not necessarily as part of the summer, but beyond summer, we're sort of expanding into doing the work that actually can lead to 
new tools for social scientists and then new problems and approaches for machine learning people um, who are interested in kind of solving real large scale, large scale problems. Um, so, and I can talk more about that later if people, people have, have questions. Um, but that's kind of, I mean, I think that's basically what I had to, you know, I'm happy to take more questions. But if people are interested, you know, for this summer, the, it, it's, it's already sort of too late, but there will be next summer. Uh, so if people are interested in the fellowship, you know, we, we're going to have a 2016 program. And then, you know, we're always also looking for the plug for, you know, postdocs and, and, and people who build software. To, to come and work with us, whether in a full-time, part-time, um, whatever capacity people are interested in. But yeah, so I'm happy to take questions, talk more about you know, any of the things I've talked about, more projects, the program, other questions. Um, yeah, thanks. As long as the interesting question. Yeah, you had a question. Sorry, behind you. Yeah. No, no, you. Sorry, he was also raising his hand. <laughs> so, yeah, sorry. Um, uh, so my question was, your video uh, had all these people saying, oh, wow, I didn't realize this and this. And it's a marketing video. Sorry, no. <laughs> it's a marketing video. No, Yeah, so, so different projects have different levels of sustainability. Um, and, and you know, just like everything else, it's a function of funding. Um, so what we end up, so what the nonprofit gets at a minimum is um, they have a specific problem that we help partially solve. None of these problems are solved, right? Three months is just not going to solve the problem. Um, and that's not the goal either. So when I, that's why, you know, it, when I had the goals of the fellowship, Nowhere was a goal that says, uh, we will solve these problems and deliver these things to people. If I wanted to do that, I wouldn't do it at University of Chicago. I would have some sort of external thing that is hiring full-time people and doing it. And so the goal isn't to, um, I think that goal needs to be met. <laughs> uh, uh, this program is not for that. So this program, the, the nonprofit, is initially kind of getting a better sense for what they could do. They are getting a partial solution to a larger problem that they face. Um, they're connected with other nonprofits who can, who they now understand they're interested in similar things. They're getting a peer network. They're getting connected to this community. So one of the things we do is over the summer we do a lot of happy hours where we invite all of them, we invite local nonprofits, governments, tech community to kind of let them mingle and get to know each other. And so they, they end up hiring a lot of people from that community because they never knew they existed and they didn't know what, how to get to them and vice versa. Um, for a small number of these projects, um, depending on, so, so we continue, so the, the public health, we're actually working with them right now and implementing things inside. Uh, so now we have, you know, we're building stuff into their, into the city of Chicago infrastructure. So some of them are sustainable. Some of them we hand over to them and they continue doing this work. Um, and some of them get dropped at the end of the summer. And we sort of really treat them as, you know, training projects, both training on the, uh, the organization side and our side. Um, but it's a spectrum. And some, you know, on one end it's, it's, it's implementation, on the other end it's we give them something that they, they learn from and then they improve and go off other, doing other things. Um, and that's a, that's, that's a limitation that we are, we're trying to figure out how do we work with other people to transition these projects. Because the, what I sort of think is that doing the initial part is hard, it's high risk. Once you've proven that this is a solvable problem and you've done a prototype, then hopefully other people can take it over from there and they have a better business case. <laughs> Say, hey, it's been, you know, we've done this part, can we scale it? We're trying to figure out how, wh who do we partner with, you know, to kind of transition uh, uh, these types of, of projects. So, you had a question? Yeah. No, they're getting paid. Uh, so this, this is, yeah, yeah, it, we're competing with with you know the, the companies I talked about, right? So they can go there, or they can come here. So so we don't we don't compete in the, in that amount of money, but we pay them. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. 
absolutely. Right. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just, as, a, as a policy person, and also as someone who yeah. is doing this work, I'm sort of curious as to what you see as which yeah. model is maybe best, or if all three are good, and what you see as like the future of that sort of. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good question. And, and each of the models have their pros and cons. Um, so if you start with the Kaggle model, um, the Kaggle model is, hasn't worked for Kaggle. Right? That's why they're not doing well. Uh, and not as a nonprofit model, but just as a company's. So none of the things that have been produced on Kaggle have gone anywhere. Because none of the organizations, it, it, the data that's being put out there is not real. It's not the complete data. A lot of these problems have data that's indivi about individuals. It's very private data. It can't be released in the open. So that limits the applicability of the solution that's built on data that ha that's publicly available in some way. And so I think the Kaggle model is, is, a, is a good idea to include a scalable crowdsourced model to do these things is really good. But, but what Kaggle focuses on is the, the model part, right? The data is nicely structured. It's cleaned. It's all there. The hard part, the, it's been formulated. The evaluation metrics have been defined. It, all the hard part that happens is done. And now the, the for loop over each modeling approach is left. <laughs> And so I think the Kaggle model makes a lot of sense. The Kaggle implementation, I think it's not a, not a model that, that'll work for anyone uh, unless you change the way you also crowdsource the, the scoping and the formulation and, and all the, you know, what is the problem? And that's, that's the bottleneck. It's not that we can't run for loops over our data predicting something, right? We all know how to do that. And that's what Kaggle competitions are. I mean, to be fair, people really spend a lot of time. That's why the same people end up winning. They've got really robust for loops. Um, so I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm you know, uh, minimizing their contribution. So uh, it's, it's unfair. Um, I think the data kind model is interesting. And they're also trying to figure out what the right model is. So they started with the data dive model. They realized that this, the sustainability doesn't happen, right? The, the weekend ends, and what do I do now? Um, so what's great about the data kind model is initial model was that it got communities together. It got people to get together in a neighborhood, in a, in a city and get to know each other so they could continue this work afterwards. The, the thing that was produced in the, in, the, in, the, in, this, in the weekend didn't really go anywhere, which is why now they've been trying to do their internal in-house. So they're hiring an in-house team of data scientists to do dedicated work with these nonprofits as opposed to hopefully relying on. So they're still doing the data dives to create these communities. Um, and I think that's great because it's getting, it's getting more people involved. Um, so the pros are more people involved, um, more nonprofits involved, just having more you know, awareness. The cons are sustainability is, you know, and same with our model. Like the pros are I'm getting a lot of people involved, students are getting involved, nonprofits are getting involved. It's a focused summer thing, and we do things around non-summer as well. But the cons are, again, sustainability is a big problem right now. Like that's something I don't have a good answer for. Um, ideally, I think we need all of them, right? We need, we need students to be involved in this. We need people in, out in the workforce to be doing this. People, some, people should be, some people should be dedicated to doing this. Some people should be doing it on their free time. Uh, some people should have these stints of fellowships of three months, six months, a year. Um, and, and all of this kind of needs to happen. You know, it has to be sustainable. So corporations need to spend maybe their CSR money should be going towards skilled work as opposed to unskilled work, which is what most of the money goes to right now. Um, so all that long answer is to say, I don't know. <laughs> uh, there, I think all of them are required. Everybody's doing things. I mean, there's another organization called Bayes Impact, which we were talking about earlier. They're trying to do similar things. They've, a different model. Um, but I think the more, at this point, there's so few people doing this that the more it happens, you know, we'll figure out the right model. I think right now is, it just needs to be more people getting involved. Uh, and that's kind of the goal right now is giving people ways to get involved. Um, and, and I don't think anybody has a really perfect model that gets anybody get involved really easily with low overhead and produces something that's sustainable <laughs> that moves forward. Uh, nobody has that right now. Yeah, yeah, it's a, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, um, it's a partially a mess. Um, so what happens is we, we select fellows, and so right now is the time when we're almost done. We have like 39 fellows who have said yes, and we're waiting for a couple of them to get back to us. Um, and what we then do is we send out a list of projects that we have scoped for the summer, and we ask people for their top three, four, five um, projects that they would like to do. We take that. Uh, and do a matching 
and, and that's a, you know, a big messy optimization where we're trying to make sure that everybody gets something they're excited about, but also that the projects um, have, if the project needs you know, NLP, uh, at least one person in the team should know that. And then the project shouldn't have all computer scientists in there, and they shouldn't all be from the same school, and so it's uh, and they should all you know it should be a right kind of seniority, and not everybody the best people and the more senior people. So we kind of have all these different criteria, and we try to have something that people are happy with. the 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 the, the good thing is that all this happens in the same space, right? So like it's and everybody's together. So people are working in teams, but people collaborate a lot. They might find a project that they're really excited about, and they're working in their spare time. People start other project collaborations with other people they, they, they get to meet and they continue working on them. So right now, a lot of people from the past couple of years are working with each other on other projects in their local communities, with other nonprofits, on research projects. So the projects are important, but, but it's really the, 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 the other things that, that you know, end up dominating. Some projects, so let's say, I mean, so one thing that's common across most of projects is pretty sensitive data. Uh, most of these are not public data. You know, at the school, it's, it's FERPA, uh, if you have work with the federal you know, education uh, reporting. And so if it's medic, public health data, it's, it's HIPAA. Uh, so all of them are sensitive. They all involve personal data about people because otherwise, and that's something we're very particular on, right? If what we produce can't be used by you, then well, there's no point in us doing this, this work. Um, so we do require them giving us access to all the data that they have, which leads to, so they're sensitive, which means laptop, we, we try to keep data on the servers and ask them, you know, you're not downloading it. Um, in terms of size, I would say, you know, 25% of the projects are where we do need large scale. It's when we're doing with Enroll America, it's every person in the country had terabytes of data. And so you do need, you know, for some of the other work we're doing, a career builder that was looking at all of the resumes and all the job postings and trying to find the gaps. Uh, and so we do use the open map reduce uh, over the text data to try to do extractions in parallel and all the annotations and then do these comparisons and record linkage. Um, and then we've got data from, you know, uh, like we have the uh, Homeless Alliance in Chicago, which has uh, 100 facilities and data about 20,000 people. So that's, you know, a few tens of gigs, maybe 10 gigs, five gigs. Um, so we've got, you know, small data sets that, that you can maybe do on a powerful laptop to most projects need servers. Uh, and then, you know, two, three, four projects a year will need larger machines that, that so everything we do typically is AWS. We just go off and, and run things there. One, it's just more secure. Two, it's, you know, if you need to scale and do map reduce, we can do that easily. We've got database infrastructure there. We've got everything set up. So that's our typical. Um, but it is, overall, the scale is on the smaller side of what I have done, you know, in general people do, right? We're not dealing with terabytes regularly. Most projects are in the tens of gigs uh, because that's kind of where the nonprofit world is right now. They don't, they don't generate that much data in a typical um, organization. What's the what's the organization? Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just curious if you have sort of any anecdotes or any evidence to show that some 
Yeah, I mean that's that's a that's a good point, right? So that that is that is certainly happening. It's as you said, it's it's always slower than you would like it to be, um, but it's faster than it has been. Um, so so for example, with the public health department, that's been our we started kind of we went to them and you know we talked to them. They wanted to their biggest problem was HIV STI. So th that's the biggest problem public health you know in urban areas right now they're facing, and. Um, but they, they, that team wasn't that interested in working with us. Like, well, I don't know what you guys can do. We're, you know, we're fine. We don't need. There's no problem. Uh, and the lead team said, "Oh yeah, we, we'll, we'll, we'll take your help." And what that did was, the so lead was important, but you know, not as important. Uh, but the team was more excited, so we, we were very opportunistic. Like, okay, it's a big enough problem that we can take it, and, and even if we can do something. Three months ago, the HIV team and STI team came back to us. <laughs> And so we heard you did this with, with the, the, the lead team. We would really love to work with you guys. Um, and, and then you know, the whole the public health department, their whole thing became, we want to do everything preventative. We've been doing this pro, you know, reactive thing. Their commissioner started talking about it. He ended up leaving public health department and going to this Trinity hospital system, which is like the third largest hospital system. And they are putting in a billion dollars into community development because for one is for good reasons, but other is if they can improve the health of their communities, it's cheaper to service them. <laughs> right, so it makes perfect business sense. He came back to us and said, hey, we're, I'm doing this community development thing. Can we work together and can you identify other people around the country who would be interested in helping us do this data science thing? And so, so I mean, that's one anecdote, but, but that's the idea is, you know, we'll be very opportunistic. We don't go into an agenda. So we just want to help. Um, and giving them use cases, giving them examples. One of the reasons we're producing these videos is to kind of show them, here's the kind of breadth that we're not going deep into, we're not taking over public health because we don't have expertise in public health. Um, we, need, we still need you guys, but, but we need to collaborate. So we're seeing that happen, and we're also seeing it happen across, so same for the school district work. We did with one school district, they connect us to another one, and they connect to the third one, and now we have 10 or 12, and they're asking us to present at this the, the national conference where they're going to bring in a bunch of their evaluation and research people. So that's what we're trying to do is kind of just have it be very bottom up <laughs> and, and them sort of them seeing these things. So hopefully that's going to have you know, some impact. And the local government is the place where it's going to happen. I mean, federal is, is going to change, but it's not going to make an impact anytime soon. Local is where you're going to see these things happen. Yep. Uh, yeah. <laughs> more of a question. So I'm, I'm working on a project right now with, uh, with a nonprofit where we're going to be pulling around different modeling uh -huh. approaches. And uh, one, one, one particular aspect about the nonprofit which I want to mention is that they just don't have a lot of, they don't really educate people, right? And they don't have a lot of data capacity. That, one of the worries about handing off like, yeah. a predictive model is for them, right? It's like I can run all my four loops, I can do all the right, I can do this all yeah. the Yeah, so that, that's, that's been, I mean, what we've been trying to do as much is try to build in things that we can still maintain some of that work. So, so having them call our API, so we update the model, we get the feed, we, we keep, that requires more sustainable work. But we know if we just hand over the model to them, that doesn't do anything. Um, so, so what we've been trying to do is figure out um, one little bit of, we train them a little bit on how to do this, at least explain how it works so that it's not a magic black box thing for them. Um, but then try to continue to, to update things. And that's sort of also, that, that's one way of, I don't think it's going to be a handover. I think it's going to be a, a continuous involvement. Um, because they don't, and they have more c capacity to hire data people than, than modeling people, right? Like they, they might be able to hire somebody, a programmer, who can do stuff with data, or an Excel person who can do stuff with data, but they won't be able to build and maintain the models. So one of the things we've been trying to do is get them to focus more on getting their data right and, and collecting more data, collecting more frequent data, get, collecting better data, so that if they're focusing on that, then we can help them focus on the, on the second piece. But that's a, yeah, it's not a, right now they're not ready for, to hand over you know, Python code that, that does something. So we're trying to, as much of it as, you know, we explain to them what it is, but then Treat it as okay. Here's the input. Here's the output, and and use it in a way that's that they understand. So, yep. Yeah. That's 
right. That's right. So I thought you were going to go somewhere else, but I'll so I'll answer both the question you and asked and the question I thought you were going to ask. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, two for one, exactly. So, so I'll start with the, the question that, that the, the your question of yeah, it's it's. We're, I mean, the goal is to do something real, right? And in reality, you you are at time t, and I have to make a decision about tomorrow. But then tomorrow I have more data, and so so even when we're doing our validation, the way we explain to these people is we're simulating this world, right? So we're we're taking data from just like you do cross validation, in a in a in a time world, you predict for the next. How how long am I predicting in the future? What is my model update time? Uh, and I, I evaluated this way to figure out what's the optimal update time and what's the optimal. The, the, and the other thing that the, the question that sort of I thought you were going to ask is there are a lot of commonalities across the project I talked about. Um, there is there is this retention you know problem which in the in the corporate world is a churn problem. Can I predict you're going to come back? Um, there are resource ranking problems where I'm ranking, allocating resources and saying, you know, I can only, I only have this much money. Who do I go after? Um, that's for economic investments in places. That's for students retention. That's for, so one of the things we're trying to do is build um, kind of these open source pipelines for common problems that nonprofits and governments will face and say, okay, in, in, in giving people so that's what we're going to try. We're working on them right now. We're going to try this summer for the students coming in to start using those things and see. And and the, the the use cases we have, we'll see. We can build things that are that at least satisfy those projects, and and then kind of expand from there to let these organizations uh, have an idea of if you're dealing with this kind of a problem, here's the data you need. Here's the structure. If you put it in this form, we will give you these kinds of outputs. So that's the intention. Is Building reusable components that will predict different things, um, and then also the next step is to kind of think about how do we help them with behavior change, because that's less software. We can suggest experiments, we can still give them the methodology, but it's it's not about building software. It's but with a low hanging fruit is places where the actions are fixed. It's the ranking problem. If I can just view the right ranking, you have the perfect intervention. You just go from the top down and you stop when you're done. So that's the low hanging fruit <laughs> right now. But the next step is sort of how do we help them understand, you know, how do you do experiments? So, you know, why is a control group actually useful? Why, uh, what's the right way to do this and all that? You know, how can you do it without completely experimental data? Um, but yeah. Thanks. Yeah.